Welcome back to lecture everyone. Today we turn our attention to chapter 2 of the textbook as we focus on sex crimes and the law. There are a few things we're going to cover today so let's begin with our chapter objectives. First we're going to spend some time looking at sex offenses from a historical approach. We're going to look at the Hammurabi Code, biblical constructs surrounding sex offenses, and how these issues translate into modern conceptions of sexual crimes. Next, we're going to evaluate key legal concepts and how we understand and define criminal law. In this section of lecture, we will examine what constitutes criminal offenses in a general sense before we work, to, before we work toward sex crimes. So what is a criminal act? What is criminal intent? How does that differ from motive? As we make our way into an examination of sexual offenses, we will look at how they are codified. Your textbook discusses the differences in codified laws between states, but in lecture we will be focusing on these offenses in a general sense based on definition. Finally, we will look at different types of crimes and discuss the differences between what actions constitute specific crimes like rape, sexual assault, and sexual battery. Let's go ahead and get started. So to begin with, we see some of the first codified laws existing with the creation of the Code of Hammurabi. The Code of Hammurabi was created by an ancient Babylonian king named Hammurabi, who created the laws as a way to inform his kingdom of what behaviors are legal and which behaviors are not. This is the code and it speaks of revenge for crimes. More specifically, this is where we get the concept of lax talonis, or eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This suggests that whatever you do to me, I should be able to do to you in return. Hammurabi's code does speak about a variety of different issues, including household issues, workplace issues, and family issues like divorce, inheritance, and other types of um, events to consider. The code also speaks to sexual crimes as well. In terms of sexual offenses, things are somewhat similar to current laws, but also a little bit different. For example, it is a crime, it is currently not a crime if you don't want to have sex with your wife. In ancient Mesopotamia, it was essential for married couples to reproduce for population purposes. So if you're not doing that, then you're dragging down the community's chances for longevity. Other items are still illegal today, such as incest, and when it comes to adultery, that remained illegal in the United States, around the world for a long period of time as well, and currently remains the basis for many divorces in the U.S. as well as other countries. However, it's not currently criminal except for in military courts as we discussed in the very first chapter. If you are going to criminalize something, then you need to have a punishment included. However, the punishment is not what we would associate with punishment today. If you were accused of adultery, for example, under Hammurabi's code, Commonly, that offense would be punished with corporal punishment or even with death. If we look at things from a biblical perspective, we see some crimes that are similar to those listed in Hammurabi's code, but with some additional information or additional items rather added in. For example, in the Ten Commandments, we specifically see references to adultery and to lust through the coveting of another's wife. In other words, do not desire or seek to attract the attention of someone else's spouse because that behavior could very easily lead to adultery. In terms of the Old Testament, we still see adultery being listed as a crime, but with Old Testament text, things, take, things are taken one step further and begin to introduce things like bestiality, which we know is sexual intercourse with animals, homosexuality, incest, lying about your virginity, Bigamy, which in this case is described as marrying both a woman and her daughter. In addition, we also th see things like masturbation being listed as a crime. This rationale behind masturbation being listed as an offense rests in the idea of population growth. If an individual is masturbating rather than having sex with a spouse, then that individual is limiting the ability in which he or she can procreate and therefore is a wasted sexual encounter. We also see things like prostitution, which is still illegal today. We see rape and other more specific crimes or more specific versions of prior crimes that we have already discussed this semester. So as we move out of historical and biblical connotations of what constitutes a sex crime, we now have to talk about more modern approaches and we're looking at things from a more modern perspective. We have to ask ourselves currently, 
What behaviors constitute sex crimes in the United States and all around the world? However, before we really can get into more of a fundamental discussion of what constitutes a sex crime, we really need to take a look at what constitutes criminal action in a general sense. So let's take a look at what criminal law is from a fundamental level and discuss the elements that need to be in place in order for a behavior to be considered outlawed. In chapter three, we're going to discuss sexual deviance. When we talk about deviant behavior, these are types of actions that violate group norms but do not necessarily constitute criminal behavior. Criminal behavior is when an individual engages in a specific action or fails to complete a specific action and therefore violates the law. When an individual engages in something criminal, typically a punishment follows the behavior. In order for our peaceful society to exist, laws need to be in place in order to govern the actions of its citizens, to allow for coexistence among groups, to define who is the guilty party, and to adequately punish that guilty party upon completion of the criminal behavior. These are pretty fundamental and straightforward aspects of criminal law that are present in the United States and around the world. On the previous slide, I mentioned to you that a behavior can either be an action or a failure of an individual to act. That this is considered the actus reus and is one part of the legal equation necessary to determine guilt. This means that an individual has to engage in a specific behavior. For example, raping someone is an overt act. If the action is omission, this means that a person has to fail to act. For example, a lifeguard who fails to jump into the water and save a drowning victim is an act of omission. The person did not necessarily engage in any sort of action that would threaten the life of another person, but when danger presented itself, the lifeguard failed to act. This is a crime of omission because the lifeguard had a duty to intervene. In, another, in either instance, whether the actor overtly acted or failed to act, this behavior is considered equal in the eyes of the law. Either way, the offender is guilty of a criminal action. The next item in our criminal equation focuses on intent. The mens rea, or the guilty mind, focuses on the guilty mind and the desire of an individual to commit a crime. This can vary in terms of the specific crime committed and may require premeditation in order to prove the guilt of the offender for whatever, for other types of crimes. Criminal intent varies in terms of whether or not the action was purposeful or whether the person acted in a reckless or negligent type of manner. When an individual behaves in a reckless or negligent manner, then the desire or the intent to commit harm may be absent, but the individual still acted in a dangerous way that was likely to result in the harm of another. Sometimes intent does not need to be present in order for the offender to still be charged with a crime. This is considered strict liability, and these crimes do not require intent. For example, statutory rape is considered a strict liability offense due to the nature of the crime and the parties who are involved. Statutory rape is when two individuals engage in a consensual sexual activity or relationship, but one of them is a minor, which means that that individual cannot legally provide consent due to being underage. However, because the action or the behavior was not forceful and was otherwise consensual minus the issue of the legal age of consent, most states are able to prosecute the adult in the relationship under statutory rape laws, which do not require intent to sleep with a minor. Now that we have established that criminal law or that, that criminal law needs both an act and an intent, we can begin examining two different categories of criminal behavior. First are crimes that are considered to be mala in se. Many of these mala in se crimes translate back to the biblical crimes we were talking about before. These crimes include things like murder, robbery, and theft. These are all crimes that are wrong for moral reasons and also for legal ones. In contrast, malaprohibita crimes are wrong because someone decided that they are wrong. These types of offenses have been made illegal because of societal need, not because they are inherently or morally wrong. Some examples include marijuana use, gambling, prostitution, public intoxication, carrying a concealed weapon without a license, and tax evasion. 
If we look at marijuana use, this is a type of offense that very recently has seen some ebb and flow in terms of illegality. At the federal level, marijuana use is still illegal, but at the state level, many different states have allowed for, legaliz for legislation that allows legalization of either recreational or medicinal marijuana. In other words, this shows a prime example that something is illegal only because someone has decreed it to be so. Things could change tomorrow if we wanted it to. Then we have to take into account the punishment. The punishment is based on severity of the offense, and in the United States, crimes are broken up into two groups, misdemeanors and felonies. Misdemeanors are typically considered the less severe of the two crime categories and often result in minimal imprisonment time, typically less than one year in jail. Felonies, on the other hand, are considered the more severe of the two and can result in punishments that are long, that that incarcerate you for one year and one day or more in prison. Typically, the rule is a year and a day at a minimum for felonies, but felonies can result in life in prison with or without the possibility of parole or even the death penalty. So now let's apply these concepts to sexually based crimes. We have already defined what a sex crime is in the first chapter that we saw this semester, but as a reminder, it is anything that an individual does that is against the law and is sexually based in nature. This could include contact offenses like prostitution, incest, or bestiality, or non-contact offenses like indecent exposure or child pornography. When we talk about rape in the conversation of criminal law, we first have to look at common law definitions of rape. Remember, rape today is defined differently compared to older definitions. Under common law, rape had to occur between a male offender and a female victim, provided that the two parties were not married. If they were married, then marital rape exemptions apply. The last marital rape exemptions were eliminated in the United States in 1993, so not that long ago. The more modern definition of rape eliminates the gender requirements for the offender and for the victim, and the marital rape exemptions are completely gone, as I just mentioned. Furthermore, any type of sexual penetration is now considered rape. No longer is va vaginal penetration the only type of sexual penetration to be considered rape. Finally, there are some exemptions that can be made in regard to the age of the offender and the victim, provided there is a prior, ex prior existing relationship that, that took place between the two. Nearly all states provide Romeo and Juliet clauses that allow for younger individuals, namely older minors and younger adults, who might be involved in a romantic relationship. Technically, the minor cannot provide legal consent to engage in a sexual relationship with an adult, but the sexual activity is not forced or coerced in any way. Otherwise known as statutory rape, these relationships and exemptions allow for more lenient styles of prosecution in compared to forcible rape prosecution. In comparison to rape, the majority of states have sexual battery and sexual assault laws that are similar to what we already defined as rape. Really, the term rape is antiquated from a prosecution standpoint, and most often we prosecute under individuals for sexual battery. It's very e easy to differentiate sexual battery from sexual assault. Sexual battery involves penetration, but sexual assault does not. So sexual battery is really, sex is really rape meaning that there is penetration of the victim by the offender's sex organs or by some other item, and sexual assault is all other types of non-consensual sexual contact that does not include penetration. However, when we discuss sexual battery and assault, we typically frame them in a conversation including adult victims. When there are children involved, we are discussing different types of criminal behavior. Children have always th been thought of in a more protective sense, but it is not until the late 1800s until formal steps were taken to formally provide protection from a legal standpoint. The Child Savers Movement is responsible for a lot of this protection and was largely influential in the creation of a separate juvenile justice system for the prosecution of juvenile offenders. The Child Savers were also responsible for the protection of adolescents from a sexual standpoint and helped, provi helped promote raise the age efforts for the age of sexual consent. Thanks to their efforts, the age of sexual consent in this country still remains between 18 or re, between 16 rather and 18 years old. In a minute, I will show you the breakdown of different states and the age of consent in each one. 
But when we're talking about, cri about crimes against children, we predominantly see individuals who are prosecuted for statutory rape, child molestation, and child sexual abuse. These will depend on the age of the victim and the sexual activity that occurs. From this map, you can see the breakdown of states that have the age of sexual consent set at 16, 17, or 18 years of age. The majority of states, 30 in total, have set the age of consent at 16. An additional 8 states have set the age of consent at 17. And the rest of the states, 12 in total, have set the age of consent at 18 years of age. 18 is the only time you are completely clear of crimes such as statutory rape. Even in states in which the age of sexual consent has been met, meaning 16 or 17 years of age, anyone who engages in sex in some kind of sexual activity with a 16 or 17 year old can still be prosecuted for statutory rape, provided that the other party is above 18 years of age. Statutory rape is a kind of different type of offense because both parties have technically consented to the sexual activity. However, the minor in question is legally unable to provide consent much in the same way that a minor cannot enter a business contract. Consent is not possible here. So even though a minor does not object to the sexual activity, the adult in the situation can still be prosecuted. In states that have Romeo and Juliet clauses that we discussed earlier, the penalties for statutory rape can be lessened if there is a three to five year age gap between parties dependent on the state in question. If the offender is any older than that, the lesser penalties go out the window. On this slide, I have provided a variety of different types of crimes that can occur against a child. For the most part, they are all treated the same. It just depends on the specific state that you are being prosecuted in. There is one exception here. Child abuse, is, in a general sense, does not include a sexual component. It can include physical non-sexual abuse, but it is not appropriate to include things like child molestation or child sexual abuse under the blanket term of child abuse. Let's switch gears a little bit and discuss child pornography for a few minutes. This is a pretty widespread offense and with the technolog technological advances we have seen in the last 20 to 30 years, it is becoming more prominent than ever. Child pornography is, a, is very different than legal adult pornography, but it was not until 1977 in which the, first federal, um, in which the federal government first formally made child pornography illegal with the introduction of the Sexual Exploit Exploitation of Children Act. When we are talking about child pornography, it can come in a variety of different mediums, but the important thing is that there must be a minor involved in some way. The minor doesn't even need to be a real child. All that is needed is a visual depiction of someone who is under the age of 18. Child pornography is typically a federal offense due to the use of the internet or some other means of receiving the material. The internet is treated much like the is treated much in the same way like the mail system in that it relies on sending the material across borders and across wires. So it falls under the jurisdiction of the federal government. Child pornography charges are much like drug charges. Part of the crime relies on possession. Do you have control and custody of the material in question? Then once that is established, the government looks to see how much of the pornography you have in your possession and the medium in which that material exists. Video clips are prosecuted much more harshly than still photography. First time offenders generally receive, receive less time than repeat offenders. However, if it is determined that you created the child pornography rather than simply possessing it, you will receive a harsher sentence than you would for possession only charges. Prostitution, on the other hand, is a controversial type of sex offense because it is considered one of these victimless crimes. Some advocate for the legalization and regulation of prostitution across the country, much like it is in Germany, Amsterdam, and Nevada. But regardless of its legality, prostitution is considered the exchange of a sex act for some sort of compensation. That could be money or an item that has some sort of monetary value. This semester, we're going to discuss prostitution in more detail, but there is a hierarchy of sort, sorts among those who engage in prostitution. Street prostitutes are considered the lowest in that hierarchy. Outdoor prostitutes are much more likely to be injured or even killed by their clients and often receive less money than those who work indoor, indoors. They need to rely on a third party, like a pimp, 
for protection, which also eats into their profits. Indoor prostitutes who work as escorts or in brothels have much more control over the types of clients they service and how much they are willing to charge for specific acts. These prostitutes are considered the elite prostitutes and often have a high-end clientele like celebrities and politicians. However, in terms of prosecution, both the client and the prostitute can be charged for the offense. Bestiality is a little bit different still. Many states don't actually have bestiality statutes on the books, so they will have to charge the offender with animal cruelty instead. But bestiality is basically having sex with an animal. Most individuals who engage in this practice do so because they are sexually attracted to animals or lack adult relationships. So they fit into the first category that is listed on your screen. It is not often that those who engage in bestiality will go as far as to harm the animal or kill the animal. That is a bit of an extreme style of bestiality and is not very common at all. We will talk about this more in depth later on as we make our way through the semester. I just wanted to give you an introduction into some of these topics from a legal perspective. This lecture focused on the law and prosecution surrounding sex crimes from a general sense. There's a lot more to it than what was discussed here, but we needed to lay the foundation out before we could really go as in-depth as we need to for some of these specific topics. Sex crimes are often difficult to prosecute because the issue of consent and force are often up for debate. Other offenses like child pornography are much easier to prosecute because the offender has the physical evidence in their possession. Throughout the semester, we will discuss the necessary elements for many of these crimes to be prosecuted and the lasting harms that are caused by the offender when they are committed. Join me back here next time when we begin exploring sexual deviance in Chapter 3. I hope to see you then.